Welcome back. I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm talking to Andrew Johnson about alleged free energy devices. Now, you might be wondering what this is on my desk. Uh, I've done my own little bit of research to try and look into the claims of somebody called Stan Myers. Now, Stan Myers um, allegedly um, created an energy device which um, was quite simple in its operation, seemingly, and he was supposedly driving around America in a car powered by water. This was in the mid-1990s, and um, he was approached by uh, the military who wanted to, to well, he, he, I think he went to the Pentagon eventually, yes. and they wanted to secretize his technology, that's what they told him, uh, when he refused, uh, not long after that point in time, he came running out of a restaurant saying he'd been poisoned and he dropped down dead. Right. Okay. Uh, let's just take a little look at this clip from Stan Myers in 1995. My life has been uh, threatened uh, many times. Uh, of course, I happen to believe in the power of angels. And if I don't believe in the power of angels, I don't believe I'll be around here too long. For 20 years, he has been refining a method to fracture water, which produces vast amounts of hydrogen on demand. Alloy rods, acting as electrodes, are housed in a perspex container that's filled with water. Normal mains voltage is fed in through a transformer, but critically, there is virtually no current consumed, less than half an amp. The result is dramatic. Hydrogen pours off, the flick of a switch. Meyer claims the key is his electronics, which pulses electricity rapidly across the rods at up to 20,000 cycles per second. Whereas in conventional electrolysis, three times as much energy is consumed as is produced in the form of hydrogen fuel, in Meyer's apparatus, the reverse is true. It appears to produce several hundred percent more energy than it consumes. Uh, we brought the water fuel cell uh, to Washington, D.C., and, of course, I had tweaked it in such a way to produce an enormous amount of hydrogen, oxygen, and gas, and the patent examiner said, no, it will not work uh, based on the electrolysis process, and uh, when we turned it on and produced an enormous amount of hydrogen and gas, uh, the examiner finally realized that we were doing exactly that and uh, went out in the hallway and started screaming and hollering to everybody on the floor, put out all your cigarettes, hydrogen, hydrogen in the building. So we started laughing and said, well, we certainly convinced everybody in the patent office that we can do what we say we can do. He is currently modifying a beach buggy to run on nothing but water. Well, I first got involved with Stan Mai when I went over there with a couple of colleagues to, to look at his water splitting device. And so we arrived at Stanley Mayer. He had a demonstration cell. We filled it with tap water. In fact, I did that myself. And he switched it on. And almost instantly, there were three jaws dropped because of the, the, the rate at which the gas poured off. It was quite spectacular. Whatever energy source Stan Meyer had tapped, it was not explicable by the electric power that was going into it. So something was powering it outside of conventional wisdom. There is no question that the gas coming off in such abundance is hydrogen. Meyer ignites it to produce a high temperature flame able to cut through metal. Now then, Andrew, as I mentioned, I've done my own research into Stan Myers, and basically uh, I looked up on the internet everything that I could get hold of, uh, copies of his patents, uh, videos that, that he explains how this thing works, and really I didn't know what to believe with it. I didn't believe or disbelieve. I was open-minded. I would go on to physics forums where they're just basically laughing at it, saying you can't get more out than in, and i have gone to other forums where they say, no, it's definitely... So I didn't know what to make of it. So... Really, my opinion is you, you, you're never going to find out unless you build one. Okay? Right. So that was what I tried to do a couple of years ago with the help of a very nice chap called Dave Worsdale. Now, um, Dave and I um, collaborated over several months, and we basically built a mock-up of, of a very basic version of what Myers had. And um, Dave manufactured these um, stainless steel tubes. You've got one tube inside another tube, and these come apart. And... Um, now, I did actually document quite a lot of what I did when, when I 
built the, the Maya cell with the help of uh, Dave Worsdale, and let's just take a look at it. Now, I mentioned that the pulses that are going to modulate or switch on and off the power MOSFET are being generated by the computer here. Now, um, this is done by using, making use of the PC's parallel port. Old computers have a parallel port and they have eight digital outputs on them. So you can use that port to switch things on and off. You could switch things on and off in your house if you wanted to using your computer's parallel port. And I've got one of those outputs wired just here coming into the oscilloscope. Now, it, the first thing I tried was I, I wrote a Windows program using um, C++ in a Windows environment and I wrote a program to turn that port on and off at a very high rate. But what I found was that the, the actual pul pulse width was varying all of the time because Windows being a multitasking operating system, it's continuously running lots and lots of other programs in the background. So if you're trying to tie up all of the time in one program, it doesn't work because you, you can't guarantee that your program is going to run. The time gets stolen away. So um, I could have tried to use interrupts, but that would have um, introduced a whole new level of complexity. So what I did was I've installed good old DOS. Using this program, I was able to get extremely precise output pulses from the computer's parallel port. And I'm going to demonstrate this. Now, I needed a programming environment in order to program write a program to be able to produce these pulses and I've written that in Turbo C which I used many years ago about 16 or 17 years ago I used to program in this language and it came back fairly quickly so I'm just going to fire up the programming environment on my DOS PC okay so this is it so this is my program which um, which actually generates the pulses and I won't go into you know the actual program itself this line here turns the output on, this one turns it off, and the whole program is, is essentially just variations of turning the thing on or off at different speeds and different rates. So I'm going to run the program. Now what you see here is a control screen where um, I can generate pulses and I can modify the speed or frequency um, and modify all kinds of other aspects. I'll switch the pulses on and we should see the pulses on the oscilloscope. So key number one turns the pulse train on. And we can see here on the oscilloscope, I've actually got six, six pulses running at um, 10 kilohertz, followed by a space of 500 microseconds. So this is known as a duty cycle. And this is what the Stan Myers uh, equipment supposedly ran on. He would have five or six pulses or maybe more between maybe four and 12 pulses on off, on off, on off, on off, followed by an off period and then followed by the same set of pulses. And the overall time is known as the duty cycle. All right, but we can also modify the pulse width. Now, I've written this control screen here in order to modify all of the different aspects of the pulses. So for example, I can actually add in another pulse in there. So I can, I can change the number of pulses. So if I just hit Q, there we go, I've got an extra pulse in there and then another one and another one. Okay, so I'm adding pulses into that, sig into that signal. I'll reduce them, go down to four, now down to three. All right, so now I can also modify the speed of the pulses or the frequency by increasing the width. Now I do this by pressing P and then you can see there, they're just getting slightly longer. So that's slightly higher than 10 kilohertz, sorry, lower than 10 kilohertz there, all right? Now the other thing that I can do is I can modify what's called the mark space ratio. So in other words, I can make the on time longer than the off time. And this I think is quite important for this device. I can also modify the duty cycle. So I can, I can modify the time that the pulses are off for. Uh, we can do this by pressing the U and H key. So I've got pairs of keys on the keyboard. You can see there the gap between the three pulses is just coming down. There we go. We're going to increase that. So I've got ultimate control over these pulse trains, and we can go up to about 80 kilohertz, which should be easily high enough for the Myers device. What you're looking at there on the scope is the input pulses to the transistor. So we're not actually connected to the circuit yet. So I'm going to connect it up, and then I'll put the oscilloscope across the, the simulated cell and see what we get.
Right, I've now connected the output of the computer through these two wires here into the circuit, which is switching this MOSFET on and off. I haven't started it yet. Um, that then switches 12 volts through the transformer, out of the other end of the transformer, through the power diode, through the simulated water cell, which is this big capacitor. Now, across this simulated water cell, I've put two resistors uh, in a ratio of 100 to 1. That steps the voltage down so that I can monitor it on the oscilloscope. So the actual voltage measured is 100 times higher than what is, appears on the oscilloscope. I've also removed the earth from the oscilloscope so I can measure a differential signal as opposed to otherwise the, the oscilloscope would affect the circuit. So I'm going to turn on the pulses. Okay, so immediately we see here, this is, this is the, the voltage across the, the capacitor and we can see we've got the pulses here which actually go gradually rise each time and this is this is it's 20 volts per division so we've got 20 40 60 we've got about 80 volts there um, across the cell now if I change the mark space ratio by um, increasing the the on time by pressing K you can see uh, if I press O you can see the voltage there is going up, so we're now we're now at uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, well over 100 volts, nearly 200 volts there across the cell. So I'll come down. Uh, now what what we can now do is so the, the next stage of the project is instead of using this big capacitor, we we use uh, the actual hydrogen cell to see if we can generate hydrogen with this pulse training. Tomorrow I'm going to go down and meet for the first time a guy called Dave Worsdale who has actually built this water cell with the two stainless steel tubes in it and we're going to connect the two together. We are in the Wolverhampton region and we're just waiting to meet Dave Worsdale who we're going to meet at 6.30 p.m. and he's going to take us to a workshop where he has got his hydrogen cell secret location, secret base. Wolverhampton. Over to you Dave, what have we got inside the, the coffee jar? <laughs> right, well this is a Tesco coffee jar and inside there are two cells, I suppose you could call them, built of uh, stainless steel. The outer is uh, one inch OD. So that means outside, outside diameter. Outside diameter, yeah. The inner is three quarters outside diameter. So if you just turn the ends to the camera Dave and then we'll get a shot of that. All right, so you can see there we've got two tubes, one inside the other. And, and how, how thick are the tubes, Dave? The outer is 1.6 millimetres, which is 16 gauge. Mm -hmm. The inner is 18 gauge, which is 1.2 millimetres. And I think the gap, the resulting gap, is mm -hmm. about 1.5 uh, millimetres. So, so there's a 1.5 millimetre gap going all the way around. Yeah. And what type of uh, steel did you say? 303 stainless. Okay. 303 stainless. Just standard tube, you know. All right. Yeah. So how, how have you managed to get them to sit exactly one and a half millimetres apart? Right, well inside uh, I've made some little plastic pips mm -hmm. uh, which uh, space the tubes mm -hmm. and also insulate the tubes from one another. Well at the top of each tube there's an M6 stud, mm -hmm. stainless again. Yeah, the studs are just welded to the tops of the tubes. The, mm -hmm. This one's welded to the outside of the outer tube. Mm -hmm. This one's welded to the inside of the right. inner. All right. And they form the uh, contacts. Right. <coughs> so you've drilled some holes in the lid of the coffee jar. Can you see that? Four holes, well, five holes. Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, they're, they're just held in with a nut on either side. There's an additional hole in there, which is obviously to let the gas out. Yeah. This is, um, this is what this tube's for here, right. that pushes into there. The idea is that when the gas is released, it comes through that tube. And the, the electrical contacts are wired onto, onto those um, nuts and bolts that you've got on the top there. Yeah. And then obviously that would normally be full of water. But what were your thoughts on how to seal it, Dave? Silicon. Okay. So is this the standard sort of silicon you use in a... Like a seal your bath, bath, your bath, bath sealant, yeah. A bath sealant. Mm. It can be refilled through there. Right. Uh, probably with a smaller tube because if you tried to fill it through there, you'd get an airlock. Right. Yes, the, the tube is, is, is dunked into the bucket, filled with water. 
turned upside down. Turned upside down while still in the bucket, so that uh -huh. yeah, it's it's filled with water, yeah. Uh -huh. And, and the, then you put the tube in. The gas bubbles up into the measuring cylinder, and it reads directly the right. volume collected. You, you've actually done a calculation as to how much energy equates to what volume that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's always shown as so. This one needs to be on the outer. Right, so that's your red. Like, like pulse you want to increase the frequency, yeah? yeah? So decrease the pulse, pulse width. So 11 kilohertz, 12.5 kilohertz, 14 kilohertz. If anybody tries this, mm -hmm. they've got to understand that it does create an explosive mixture yeah. of gases. Okay, now I did manage to produce hydrogen with the cell, Andrew, and um, but certainly wasn't at, at an over unity. There wasn't more power out than in. So I'm still on the fence with the, with the Myers device. Um, but I think when you look at Myers' actual patent, it's not cryptic, but it's it, it, it doesn't write. He hasn't written it in a way that I would say is is in conventional engineering terms. It's quite. Um, it's not easy to understand. Some of it's a, bit, a little bit ambiguous. So, and there are different versions of the circuit. Um, you know, he talks about resonance, but that, that the circuit that he puts forward in his patent, there's no way it can resonate because it's got a diode in it that prevents any resonance. It's more of a, a pumping circuit, which pumps the voltage up to a certain level, and at that point, it's supposedly supposed to crack the water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then you get this supposed flow of uh, hydrogen oxygen coming off which will come out of this tube and then you can use that to, to power whatever. Um, but as I say, the, the jury's out for me with Stan Myers, but you, you asked the question, well, why, why did he get poisoned and why did the military try and buy his right. patent? Well, I mean, I think, you know, we discussed this a, a, a little bit before you know, in previous times that we've brought this topic up in our conversations. Uh, and I, I believe that, you know, what, one of the ideas that you'd come up with is that missing from the patent was a part of the circuit which was some type of feedback mechanism mm -hmm. uh, which we don't know what that was and that would then perhaps allow the circuit to resonate and, and you know maybe that's obviously speculation because we can't see that in the actual patent mm -hmm. but what that brings us on to is this concept of resonance which comes up again and again that we, you know what you can do is and this is something that Wilbert Smith you know talked about in some of his mm -hmm. experiments where you're using some type of high frequency oscillation, whether that's in terms of physical rotation of a disc. Um, you know, going back to Bruce De Palma, he did another experiment whereby he was simply firing a ball up into the air and then watching the path and measuring how long it took to come down. And then he was changing that experiment, and the only way he was changing it was by spinning the ball at very, very high revs before he ejected it up into the air, like, you know, 10,000, 20,000 revolutions a minute, this ball was traveling. Mm -hmm. And in theory, it shouldn't have made any appreciable difference to mm -hmm. the path mm -hmm. that the ball was traveling in, in this parabolic path, but it did. Right. And the same with this Meyer thing, when you're flipping the electricity in the electrolysis process, you know, 15, 20,000 hertz, because mm -hmm. that's what he was using. He was using yep. an oscillating frequency, wasn't mm -hmm. he, yep. to crack the water, and that was mm -hmm. supposedly the key thing. Uh, that's the theme that comes up and again and again when you're doing things at high speed, you know, to, to sort of figures of 20,000 hertz, 20,000 RPM. Those are when the effects seem to come out, and I've heard Nick Cook talk about this as well in mm -hmm. the past. Okay. So, so that's one of the key things which you, which you seems to be repeated here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrew. Well, we're going to go for another break, and we will be discussing more alleged free energy devices after this. <laughs>